This is going to be Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to talk about the topic of God remembers. The first thing is God remembers individual saints. You matter just as an individual person to God. In Genesis 8, 1, it says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. What if the Lord didn't care about his creation and he just left Noah floating out there on the water until he ran out of food and supplies and the animals would have started dying and it started stinking and everything else? But the Lord remembered Noah, and God remembers you. He never forgets the saint. Even when you're pretending he doesn't exist, he's living in you. You may say that you believe God is real, but there are times when you're basically just being a practical atheist. You are a Christian, but you don't even give God a thought. Even during those times, God remembers you. So God made a wind. He made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. So the water was calmed. The fact that God made a wind shows that he never stops making things. You thought he was, he was done making things back there in Genesis chapter 2, but he's still involved in the events that take place on earth. He's still making a way. He's, he's still involved in the creation. And he has power over wind and water and storms. In Mark four thirty seven through 41, it says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? When a man messes with God, he's messing with a being that can control wind and water. And no army can go against those two things. He could wipe out every army on the planet with those two things. And we have a God that remembers the saints. A God that, th that is this powerful remembers each and every individual saint. He cares about each and every one. God was up in heaven. He looked down. He saw Noah floating around on the ark. And he remembered Noah. The next thing he remembers is the storm. It says in Genesis 8, 2, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. He doesn't have the storm go on forever. When you're going through one, you know there is light at the end of the tunnel, even if you can't see it. The Lord will eventually stop it. The rain stopped, and the water, waters were gathered in clouds. In Job 26, 8, it says, He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. Up until Noah's flood, there was probably never a cloudy day. We know that it hadn't ever even rained before until the flood, but a mist actually came up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And we read about that in Genesis 2, 6. After the flood, things seemed to be a lot different. Also, after this time, you'll see that man doesn't live as long as they used to. You read on about another character that's going to come up soon named Abraham, who only lived to be 175 years old, while Noah and pre-flood men lived to be over 900 years old. So I guess there was some type of change that came about with the flood. Something to think about is if it wasn't for man's disobedience, would there ever even have been such a thing as a storm? Sin brought storms, it brought hurricanes, it brought tornadoes, it brought cloudy days. And yet God is still merciful enough to let you open the door sometimes and you go out and it's a nice day. A lot of times I'll get out of my workplace where I work in a dark freezer and I'll come out into the open outside at the end of the day, and it's a nice day, and the sun's out, 
And I think about how God, how good God is for allowing it to be a nice day when the world is so wicked. But remember that God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. Genesis 8, 3, And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. So the waters were reduced. And it might take some time, but after a while, things will start to go back to how they used to be before the storm. Remember that you won't be under the dark clouds forever. And when it comes to Noah's flood, you still see evidence that a catastrophe took place. They say the Grand Canyon was a result of Noah's flood. Some of the places that people consider the most beautiful were the result of some type of catastrophe. The same goes with your storms in your personal life, if you take them properly. Because Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. When you're going through something that causes pain and tears and agony and affliction, tribulation and sorrow and all these things, your heart is actually made better and you become a beautiful person that people want to be around. That is, if you take the storm properly and don't use it to become bitter. Let it make you better instead of making you bitter. And you'll be better after the storm. There'll be something about you that's good that people want to be around because you've went through something. And God will make you go through tribulation so that you can help others who are going through tribulation. In Genesis 8, 4, it says, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. So Noah had a mountaintop victory. He made it through the storm. God had him safely land on a mountain in one piece, and that's a miracle. God had to guide the ark to keep it from crashing into things or from, you know, going off a, a waterfall and crashing or something. Genesis 8, 5, And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, and the tenth month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. Now the next thing, he remembers, God remembers who chose the world over him. In Genesis 8, 6, it says, And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. So Noah had made a window in the ark, and this should remind us to never forget to look up, spiritually speaking. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. God remembers who chooses this world over him. Nothing in this world can compare to God and what he has waiting on the saint. Everything up there is eternal. Everything down here is temporary. Genesis 8, 7 says, And he sent forth a raven, which went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. I've heard it taught that the raven goes to and fro because he was feeding on the floating carcasses of the ungodly who perished in the flood. And this could picture also the person who is in love with the world and doesn't ever come back to the ark. The raven doesn't ever come back. He just he goes to and fro. And people feed on the world and get full of it and they no longer have appetite for the things of God. Just like the raven, he was going around feeding on what he could find. And in Ephesians 4.14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craft craftiness or by the lie and wait to deceive. Some Christians are tossed to and fro. They're carried about by every new doctrine that comes up or every new sensational thing that they see that comes up, and they focus on that, and they forget about God and the Bible. The raven also pictures unclean spirits who go to and fro, looking for a body to inhabit. And the devil, who is also going to and fro. It says in Job 1, 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So the devil left the nest a long time ago, back before Genesis 1 1. And he, back in Genesis, between Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 2, we talk about that catastrophe that took place 
where the devil left the nest and you had the first big flood and he never came back and he only comes back to accuse the brethren and he's not allowed to come back to be in fellowship with God but the great thing about a child of God is even if they go out and live for the world the Lord will always take us back he'll take us back in fellowship and something even more amazing is that nothing even changed about their relationship the moment you became a son of God you stayed a son of God through thick and thin while your fellowship may not have always been there the relationship stayed the same. Just like sometimes with your mother or father, maybe sometimes you were going through a hard time and you lost fellowship with your parent, but the relationship always stayed the same. You were still their son or daughter. Now, Noah also sends out a dove, and this reminds me of how God remembers the church. In Genesis 8, 8 through 9, it says, also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Unlike the raven, the dove didn't find any rest in this world. The raven loved the things he saw when he was out in the world. The dove returned. Notice that Noah puts forth his hand and took her. This could picture the rapture where the Lord meets us in the air to take us out of this world. He pulls her in and to him into the ark. This reminds me of the rapture. Also remember this is in a window, the window of the ark. And those verses that seem to be prophecy about the rapture in Song of Solomon 2, 9 through 10, where it says, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And you know she's called my dove in Song of Solomon 5.2. So that could be a picture of the rapture, or at least reminds us of it. The dove is also a picture of the Holy Spirit. In Mark 1.10, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, it says, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. That's what John saw. But Noah let out the dove to test the waters. You need the dove, the Holy Spirit, to prove all things. The to test things. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. We're supposed to try the spirits. And the Holy Spirit, according to John 16.13, it says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So you need the Holy Spirit to guide you. Noah needed that dove to go out and See if the waters were dried up yet. You know, they have that soap called dove. And that is fitting because the Holy Spirit will make you clean. Uh, the Bible talks, of, uh, talks about the washing of water by the word. The Bible talks about wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. When you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit will cleanse you. They have some ice cream where I work that is also called Dove. And I really don't have anything enlightening to say about that other than it tastes better than the soap. In Genesis 8.10, it says, And he stayed yet other seven days. And again he sent forth the Dove out of the ark. Now, if Daniel's 70th week has seven years left, then this can be a picture of us being safe with the Lord during that seven-year future tribulation. So, the dove had already been pulled back into the ark, and he stayed yet other seven days. So, if the tribulation is seven years, and we're safe up in heaven with the Lord during those seven years... That's what Genesis 8.10 could remind you of. And he stayed yet other seven days. 
And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. Now what does this remind you of? The olive leaf. Read Romans 11 about the olive tree. This reminds me of, of Israel. And who's God dealing with during that seven year future time? The nation of Israel. That's why it's the time of Jacob's trouble. During that time we're safe up there with the Lord in heaven. The church is while God is dealing with Israel on earth. He's not going to deal with Israel and the church at the same time during that time frame. So, and the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth year, In the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So the storm and the effects of the storm were not there forever. The storm and its effects will pass. It will be a new day. You can start fresh and start your walk. Now Noah's going to have a place to walk. Maybe you've been out in sin and in the world and you feel like you can't even walk with God anymore. All you got to do is come to God, tell Him, confess your sin. You can get back in fellowship and you can start your walk. The face of the ground will be dry. And the mercies of God are new every morning. It talks about in Lamentations. It says in Genesis 8, 14 through 16, And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy son's wife with thee. So don't start a new life without your family. It says, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy son's wives with thee. Don't just go start a new family. Don't just start a new life without your family that you have that's looking to you. This should remind every man to lead his family to the ark for salvation and off the ark to be fruitful and multiply. In their case, they built the ark to preserve their physical life and were fruitful and multiplied to preserve mankind. But in our case, we go to the ark, which is Jesus Christ, for salvation to get eternal life, and we are fruitful and multiply. And when we give out the gospel so that others can be birthed into the family of God, that's us being fruitful and multiplying. So for us, it is more about spiritual things than physical things. Genesis eight seventeen Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of creep, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So God knows how to keep animals from going extinct. A lot of people are so worried about that, worried about certain animals going extinct. I think God can can take care of it. I don't think we need to spend our whole life worrying about stuff like that. If he wants them here, then they will be here. You would also still have, you know, fish and sharks and whales because they wouldn't have drowned in the flood. They would have had plenty to eat. And, I mean, the giants that died in the flood would have been like a golden corral buffet for the sharks. So you still had all those animals as well. And Genesis eight eighteen says, And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Notice again, you have the man having the responsibility of leading the way. Noah went forth, and his sons, and then their wives. So they have a great responsibility to be a spiritual example in the home. Genesis eight nineteen, And every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. This would be like letting several of the largest zoos out free into the wild. Probably all of them. Uh, many atheists may say, how would he have gotten every type of animal in the ark? 
But I mean, you're talking about God here who flung the sun into existence. I think he can fit all the animals in an ark if he wanted to. I don't think that that would be a problem. And I have no problem believing things like that. You just, you got to have some faith about you. You need to be like a child in that way. Have some childlike faith. Don't try to sit around and say, well, how is that possible? I mean, how is it possible that you're here when it comes right down to it? How is it possible that a baby is born? How is it possible that your heart has continued to beat all this time? You know that all that would have to happen for you to die is for your heart to stop beating. You know, who do you think is keeping your heart beating? The same person that was able to get all the animals on the ark that made the stars also, as it says in Genesis 1. I don't have a hard time believing any of this. You just got to have childlike faith when it comes to certain things. Now, up until this point, we've talked about God remembering things. Now we need to talk about remembering God. That's what Noah did when he got off the ark. In Genesis 8.20 it says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So remember God when you have made it to the mountain. Noah made it to the mountain of Ararat. God didn't forget you, so you need to remember him. And notice that Noah offered him every clean beast and every clean fowl. Don't just give God your spare time or your dead time, but give him your precious time. For example, if you have to be at work at 6 a.m., then don't just sleep until 5.45 a.m. You can get up at 4 a.m. and offer that precious time to the Lord. Don't just give him the 10-minute drive to work. In Genesis 8.21, it says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So present your bodies a living sacrifice today and be a sweet savor. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them, in them that perish. So be a sweet savor. You can live your life to where it's a sweet savor to God. Be a living sacrifice. And that's your reasonable service. But Noah built the altar, offered every clean beast, and what started out as a good thing ended up being a bad thing later on in the Bible. Noah built an altar to sacrifice to the Lord. Later on in the scripture, men began to sacrifice to their false gods on an altar. The devil loves to twist things and to make it be about him instead of being about God. Genesis 8.22 says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Many people say that in the last days you won't be able to tell one season from another season. I've heard that off and on throughout my life. However, it says, while the earth remaineth, there will remain seed time harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. So the world will continue to have seasons. You know, you have seed time, October and November. You've got winter december and january you've got cold february and march harvest april and may summer june and july hot august and september i mean for me i wish it could stay winter time i know that probably people don't like winter time but that's my favorite i just i love the cold i mean i work in a freezer too so it's not a big it's not a big change for me to leave work and it's cold outside. But the seasons will always be while the earth remaineth, according to these, according to this verse. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. But this has been Genesis chapter 8, about how God remembers. God remembers everything 
but there's something that he doesn't remember, and that's your sin if you get it under the blood. You got to get it under the blood of Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe the gospel, uh, your sin is gone. He throws it out. He takes your filthy record and puts Jesus' spotless record in there, and he doesn't see your sin anymore. And you're not judged for those sins anymore because it's judged for on the cross. So come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Paul gave us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 and made it very clear when he said, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and resurrected. And all you got to do to be saved is come to him as the guilty sinner that you are and believe that gospel. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.